Welcome. My name is Rita Hassard, and I am Library Collections Manager in the Sterling Morton Library, and I'm delighted you're here this evening. When I try to describe the Sterling Morton Library and what we do, and even the Arboretum to people, I usually use some of these words. These are the words that really bubble to the surface for me. I describe collections, collaboration, connectivity, communication, and conversation. And it's not just because I like alliteration. <laughs> but those are really the words, when I think of the Arboretum ecosystem, how we connect with each other. We connect collections and resources, and along with other colleagues here at the Arboretum, we encourage, engage, inform, and inspire tree advocates. As I was reading the overstory, I kept thinking of a quote from Stephen King, that famous horror writer. Um, and his quote is, books are uniquely portable magic. And I love that quote. And he goes on to say, a really good book transports you from your surroundings. It blocks out all the noise and suspends reality. It absorbs you in the story and takes you on a, takes you on a journey with the characters where you see and feel everything they do. And I can say that as I was reading the overstory, um, I was transported, I was surrounded, and I was engaged. There was one moment that I, um, well, more than one moment that I gasped out loud, and I, I thought I was really emotionally drawn, and I realized I was holding my breath as I was reading the story at different points. So tonight for us here at the Arboretum is a rare and magical evening. We will be spending time together witnessing a conversation about the powerful connections that exist between people and trees with two gentlemen who I consider to be watchmen in the tree world. Novelist Richard Powers has received numerous accolades and honors for his teaching and writing, including recognition as a MacArthur Fellow in 1989, the Man Booker Prize, and he was recently honored with a 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for his 12th novel, The Overstory. And I will say that um, in the library, botanical, and horticultural world, the telegraph lines were singing when that award was granted. <laughs> it was a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and it was a book about trees. <laughs> and Richard will be joined in a conversation by the eminent Andrew Hip author, blogger, and the Arboretum Senior Scientist in Plant Systematics and Director of Arborium. So welcome all. Be all right. So, and how about here? Yeah. So, Richard, it's uh, this book. First of all, it's been a delight to get a chance to get to know you a little bit today. This book was an exciting read. Um, very exciting to read a book that is so engaging and all about natural history and, in particular, trees. I was wondering if you could just start out by telling us how did you come to write a book about trees? <laughs> right. Um, this is my 12th novel, and I've been writing fiction for a third of a century. My, my first novel was published in 1985, so it's been a long and winding road, and, and this book itself took close to six years, but I've, I, I had to grin during the introduction and, and during Andrew's words, remembering my attempts when my friends and family would ask during this protracted gestation, you know, are you working on anything? <laughs> you know, um, what's it about? And I would say, yeah, I'm working on something. It's, it's about trees. And you could see, you'd see the eyebrow go up a little bit. You know, always, always, even the most devoted friends and family. And, and they would say, oh, you're writing a nonfiction book this time. I said, no, I'm writing a novel about trees. And may, maybe more than that, a novel where trees and people are both central protagonists and both reveal the story that's so hidden when one or the other is absent from the narrative. Um, so what was the question again? 
I, I've wandered a bit here. No, that's a, that's a, I was asking, how did, you, how did you decide? You've written about so many different topics. How did you end up with trees? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like this idea that I might have decided something at one point. It, you know, <laughs> it gives the illusion of kind of artistic mastery of some kind. Um, I, you know, this, this book really chose me. And, and more powerfully in some ways than, than any of the previous novels. Uh, although you would think, you know, I, I, I began the, the book at the, at the age of, you know, 54. And you'd think that an old guy, you know, who'd been at it for a while would be a little bit emotionally attenuated. And, you know, you, that the experience of discovery or, or um, ex exploration or, or you know, commitment to a topic would, couldn't match you know, the feelings of doing that at the age of 20 or 25 or 28. This book really took possession of me. And it happened, I'll tell the story. Um, it happened uh, when I was teaching at Stanford. I had taught for many years at Illinois and uh, retired, took early retirement there. And, and went down, uh, you know, took a chance on, an, on a new job out west. Um, those of you who know Stanford and Palo Alto and Silicon Valley will know it's, a, it's an odd place. And it's a lot of strange things coming together in the same, in the same very intense area. And, you know, I was teaching at this spectacular school that had been founded by this robber baron, you know, um, who had made a mint by dubious land deals involving, you know, lots of tax dollars. Um, and I was living in this, in the heart of Silicon Valley, where, you know, the, the headquarters of Apple and, and Google and Hewlett Packard and and Intel, you know, and Facebook, and that, you, the list could go on, right? All of these companies that had created the present and, and were in the process of creating the future were all in this very tight, you know, narrow valley. I, I could walk or bike to all, almost all of these headquarters within a you know, half hour. The odd thing about that place sociologically is the belief in the in the technological sublime you know our inventions are going to solve everything you know and if we can just hang on a little bit longer they'll even solve death right? <laughs> and that's an intense culture after a while, you know, if you, if you go and, you know, if every dinner party is about, you know, are you going, you know, are you on for the ride, you know, for the Methuselah ride, you know, um, that, that when I needed to escape from that future, you, I could go up into the Santa Cruz mountains on the other side of town and, and, and rediscover the, the long past and to hike un, under the regrowth redwood forests up, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains um, was a, a, the perfect antidote, an, an, antidote to this place. I have to say that I had reached that age of 55 pretty tree blind. I mean, I, I could not really tell an ash from an oak, which isn't great. You know, um, I loved them. I mean, they appealed to me aesthetically, but I didn't. I didn't have any affinity with them, and I'm. I'm a little ashamed to say that it took a creature you know, 25 feet wide and 300 feet tall and 1,800 years old to wake me up. I mean, you don't have to be a particularly sensitive soul for that, you know, <laughs> that to happen. And what what was amazing is, you know, if you walk in the in the regrowth, and you and you see these hundred year old redwoods, you think, my God, what a majestic tree! You know, because they're spectacular; it can do a lot in a century. But if you let them go eighteen centuries, you know, it's out of this world. And and to, when I saw my first old one, I just I had this moment where I just thought, you know. These mountains 
we're full of these. They were all over. And, and the belated discovery that 95 to 98% of those primary redwood forests were gone. It's just breathtaking. And then there was also this odd sense of, you know, the realization that what happened to them? You know, wh wh where did those forests go? And I learned that they went to building San Francisco <laughs> once and then to twice, right? To building uh, the railroads, the, you know, the ties that, that, uh, that uh, Stanford used to complete the Transatlantic Railroad. And finally, it occurred to me that Silicon Valley was down there because these trees were up here. And there was just this uh, electrifying moment where I thought, I don't understand human history. I thought we did this ourselves. And it was eye-opening to me to think, wow, a, a whole active cast of characters has been off stage in, in my mind and in the histories that I've been reading. Um, and now knowing, bringing them on stage completely changed my sense of who we were. And then to come down, you know, come down from those forests and to see these patches of trees, you know, big groves of old trees with paint spots on them. Well, what are those? Those were the ones that were marked for cutting. Right? Those were going to be the last ones. Right? Well, what happened? Well, actually, you know, a very short time ago, a number of people who were not intrinsically political decided that 98% might be enough. And all of a sudden, this is like, uh, I did not know this. This is a bit of American history, recent American history, that told an incredibly dramatic story and a consequential story that simply wasn't on my radar. And I just thought I would like to tell that story. Wow. The next answer will be shorter. Well, we're, we're, we're glad you did. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me as you're telling that is that you, you describe it as though you had left sort of that world of technology behind you, but one of the things that's remarkable about the book and about you as a person is, is you don't leave it behind. You seem to see in, you know, in this one character of Nile, who, had, who uh, I don't know, we have a rule about not sp no spoilers rule? Okay. <laughs> there, is a, there is a piece in this book that relates to gleaning information using machine learning to sort of solve these problems that we see. I think a lot of people tend to go off in one direction and see one solution or the other, but you've integrated them. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I myself came from that world, so I had a very strong technological bent myself. And I'm not unaware of the ways in which that world have increased, has increased our sense of separation and alienation from the living world. But I, I thought there's a more interesting tale to tell than, than that rather simple narrative of we used to live in the world and now we live in Facebook or the digital space. And I, I'm not sure that's, that's the story that's most consequential to us right now. When I had this moment of conversion and I thought, I need to tell the story about people and humans and non-humans as a single story, right? as one in which the components can't be understood in isolation of each other. In fact, an antidote to the ways in which we do think of ourselves as a separate thing and nature as a separate thing. To tell it as a single story is to acknowledge many things. One of them is simply every tool that we've ever made, every technology has changed who we think we are and what we're capable of doing. Every one comes with positive and negative affordances Right, And to think, as some readers of the book have told me, you know, I was confused by the inclusion of this story, this South Asian, first generation, uh, you know, Indian American kid whose father comes to Silicon Valley to, to help create the first microprocessor, and he's, you know, he's... Uh, 
crippled at an early age. He's a, he's, he disappears into this world. He makes a fortune writing these massive multiplayer you know, uh, online games. And he's devoted himself to this alternate world that we're building, which is just an extreme case of the alternate world that we've been building ourselves for a long time. And has this different kind of road to Damascus moment where he's saying, wait a minute, you know, this may be our key back home, right? The, 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 the readers who say, I'm committed to environmentalism, we need to get back to the land in a pre-technological way, you know, in a way that, you know, recreates the relationship to food creation and habitat that we once had before we took all these devil's you know, bargains into our, in, into our possession. I, you know, my, my response is we're not going back there, not with seven and a half billion people to feed, right? We, the prelapsarian fantasy isn't going to work. We, if we are to make it in any form, it's going to be by using our best prosthetics with their best affordances. And so the Nile story comes back as a kind of redemption of this incredibly powerful prosthetic that's enabled us to think and, and extend our ability to understand complex systems in a way that we never had before. We were talking about this earlier today when we are taking a walk in the Arboretum. It's not coincidental that ecology as a formal discipline and environmental studies that acknowledge the complex dynamical uh, relationships inside, you know, the, the 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 immensely imbricated and tangled webs of living things, emerged at the same time as computation emerged. We couldn't get there by ourselves. We needed these machines to help us make, to, to help model and and articulate and elucidate that world. So I guess finally the story is don't blame don't blame the the foot soldiers or the, the messengers, blame the generals, and that's us, you know. We we are gonna decide our salvation or damnation based on the ability to take control of the things that we've made and to 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 do um, justice to how they extend our powers. Not, not, you know, it's not gonna be a matter of um, using them uh, as if they were themselves condemning us to further separation. That's up to us, right? It's both in that view of, of sort of understanding how information flows together, understanding how people and trees are, are connected, you got this sense of networks and this repeating motif of networks throughout the book. One of the places that it really comes out is in this one character of Patricia Westerford. And she's got close similarity to another scientist, Suzanne Simard. Um, you talk about the relationship between trees and how they're sharing nutrients and her, her sort of insights on that are at the core of the book. Could you talk a little bit about First of all, how you became aware of that body of research, uh, and also, maybe more generally, how you got to know all this tree research. For those of you who haven't read the book, and those of you who have, you get the sense when, when you read it that you had just you know, retired as a forest ecologist, <laughs> and then decided, well, I'll write a book, and you were a very good novelist as well. Uh, how, how did you absorb all this stuff? Where'd you, where'd you go for your... For your knowledge. I just want to say in my defense, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's not as scary as Andrew is making it sound. <laughs> it, it is also a novel involving real people or, or recognizable people and, and their emotional relationships to each other. But I, yeah, I did fall in love with the subject matter and I just couldn't get enough of it. Um, and and to, to me, the joy of waking up every day and immersing in the enormous bibliography uh, of trees um, it just exalted me. I just, you know, I didn't want to finish the book. I just wanted to live in that research and keep <laughs> doing it. Um, but most of you in this crowd will certainly know that, that there's been a real revolution in the last 
three or four decades in how we understand what's happening in a forest. And Andrew alluded to one, which is the, the mycorrhizal, you know, the subsurface sharing of nutrients and medicines between trees through fungal intermediaries in, in the forest, even across the species barrier, right? And some of, some of Simmard's work involves, um, I think it was Douglas fir and beech? That's right. Uh, a birch. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. And the, the birch is sending um, sugars and hydrocarbons th through the fungal intermediaries and keeping this little Douglas fir you know, alive. And, and that's astonishing. I mean, just in itself, it completely overhauls our sense. You know, we've had this really misguided interpretation of, of you know, nature is red in tooth and claw. Every tree in the forest is fighting with every other tree, and it's all, you know, this last, you know, you know, trying to throw shade on everything nearby and get your little patch of energy. And then suddenly realizing it's kind of like Medicare for all down there, you know. It's, you know I mean, it, there's something else going on, you know. But, but, you know, at least this. I mean, it's complicated, and I think, I think finally working out exactly what it signifies and how it's working is decades in the, you know, still to come. But at least this, for every act of competition, there are acts of cooperation, and that is, you know, corrects a long-standing misunderstanding of the way that evolution works. I mean, when you say survival of the fittest, we've got this kind of still holdover to, you know, with Spencerian social Darwinism. It's like fittest means strongest and dominant. No, fittest, fittest means best suited to its environment. And its environment is 99.9% .9 living things, right? So to, to truly understand interdependence is to see, uh, you know, symbiosis everywhere and, and, and interdependence everywhere, certainly. Um, so that revolution is one part of the story. The other part of the story is the above-air communication of trees, where, you know, f for instance, a tree that's under assault from insects will start to produce its own insecticides, but it'll also put these chemical signals in the air, these you know, pheromones that travel outwards, and other trees detect these signals and start to produce their own insecticides preemptively. So it's like they're sharing an immune system, right? So to me, that's like this story that is to see a forest now is dependent on all its parts. And scientists know this, right? And have known it for a long time. But to take that story into, the, into a, a tale for the general public and to say, you know, we need to rethink what's going on there. And we need to use our sense of how deeply cooperative and imbricated those relationships are to realize that we're part of this story too. And we always have been. And you take it there in a, in a really nice way. I mean, you, you, you go beyond the trees are connected, all the ecosystems are connected, to people are connected to trees, and you do so in a very tangible way. You give the trees voices, people get calls from, from the trees. Did you, it, it made me wonder what, whether there was a time when you actually felt palpably as though you were, you were communicating. I don't want to make it sound kooky. No. But, you know, you know what I mean? No. Were you palpably feeling as though you were, you were receiving communication from trees? You know, it's interesting, because we were talking earlier today, Andrew said, why, you know, why, oh no, maybe this was Chris from the Trib, who said, uh, uh, you know, why, why a novel? I mean, there, this, this book is so in love with trees, did, did you want to write a, a nonfiction book about trees? And I, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons why the novel was right for me. And one was, I mean, if you're really saying this is a book about the absolute inseparability of people and non-humans, what better place than a novel, right? Because when you, when you do straight science writing, even for general audience, it's like, I'm now going to tell you about trees, as if, again, they're a separate thing. When you can tell a story about people who suddenly wake up to the fact that their whole lives have been at the mercy of these other creatures, it's a, it's a much more reciprocal, much more interdependent kind of story to begin with. The other is simply, you know, the affective power of a novel, right? Um, 
there's a there's a refrain in the book. Um, all all the facts in the world can't force a, can't make a person change his mind. Only a good story can do that, right? And uh, and and that's another thing to leverage. Just the fact that while you are, you know, my my goal was, while I am doing stuff to your cognitive sense of what's out there and, and what your relationship is, I'm also trying to twist your viscera, you know, <laughs> and, and, and get you to feel those things as, as well as think those things, right? Change of, change of mind and change of heart, you know, at the same time. I, I did feel as though my viscera were twisted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here's the other thing. I mean, it is a little woo-woo. The book is a little woo-woo. <laughs> Right? <laughs> he said it, I didn't but say. life is a little woo-woo, right? <laughs> and you can't, if you're protecting a scientific reputation, you can't go there. Although there are now scientists who have figured out how to bridge that gap. And, you know, we were talking about Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a, you know, a, a leading biologist. I mean, she's really, you know, contributed deeply to that field. But she's also a Native American and she wants to say that form of wisdom is also essential. They look like they're inimical, but they're both us, right? So you can do that in increasingly in certain kinds of like a personal essay and so forth, but it's tough to do inside a, a straight science book. Um, you know, so, so on this question of did I feel like the trees were talking to me or I needed to talk to the trees, What do you mean by talk? Okay, so, so <laughs> once, I, once I realized that they are signaling each other, both above the air and below the ground, talk started to seem less like a metaphor and more like a demonstrable thing. You know, the exchange of signals in a flexible behavior that's responding to rapid changes in the environment. I don't know how much more do you need. But the other thing about my talking to the trees, uh, I, I have a little passage. And it's a, in this passage, it, Patricia, the character that Andrew invoked, does address a tree directly. And she's a little sheepish about it first. And then she slowly gains courage and sees the value of doing this. The value was pointed out to me belatedly after I wrote the book by the writer David Abram, uh, Spell of the Sensuous, and other, other very interesting philosophical approaches to natural history. And, and David read the book, and he said, you know, I love I loved that you talked to that tree. He said, when I talk to trees, I don't expect an answer. He said, I, I don't even really believe they're n listening or at all changed by my standing down below them and babbling. But he says, when I talk to a tree, that tree, I in my head, that tree is moving from an object to a subject. Right? That's not a thing anymore. Right? That's something with agency and desire and, and behavior and volition. Should I read the passage? Yeah. Let's see if I can do this. So uh, Patricia um, was born with a, with a hearing impediment. And as often happens uh, with with little kids who, who don't hear well, her speech is impaired as she, as she begins to learn how to talk. And this creates a tremendous gulf between her and her fellow kids, the, the students she goes to school with and, and her neighbors. And happily, she's taken under the wing by her father, who's an agricultural extension agent and a great, great lover of plants. And she finds this world where she can be comfortable and happy and where she can feel like she's understanding, right? She doesn't have to hear them and she doesn't have to speak to them. She simply has to be in their presence and look and watch and, 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 and see these processes unfold. And he nurtures her in that. As a result, she's open to this idea of plant communication before a lot of the, the normative, you know, I have to say, white male gatekeepers in the field are open to the idea. She does the research, she, find, she demonstrates the, the, you know, the, the relationships, and she is mocked for it. 
as the initial researchers in over-the-air chemical signaling were historically um, taken to task by the discipline. She drops out of the field in uh, humiliation, and she begins to work a series of, of odd jobs and works her way west toward the great forests of the Pacific Northwest, uh, the, the last large, intact coniferous forests you know, in the US. And that's the passage that, that, I'll, that I'll take uh, take up her story with. In 1981, Patricia heads northwest. Giants still grow in pockets of old growth scattered from Northern California up to Washington. She wants to see what uncut forest looks like while there's still some left. The western cascades in a damp September. Nothing prepares her. From mid-distance, without any scale, the trees seem no larger than the biggest tulip poplars back east. But up close, she's lost in measurements opposite. All she can do is laugh and look some more. Hemlock, grand fir, Douglas fir, buttressed monster conifers disappear above her. Sitka spruces bulge out in burls as big as minivans. Even the runts would dominate any eastern forest. Down in the understory, Patricia's own body seems freakishly small, like one of those acorn people she made in childhood. Clicks and chatter disturb the hush. The air is so twilight green she might be underwater. It rains particles, spore clouds, broken webs, and mammal dander, skeletonized mites, bits of insect frass, and bird feather. If she holds still, vines will overrun her. She walks deeper in, crunching 10,000 invertebrates with every step, watching for tracks in a place where the native language uses the same word for footprint and understanding. The temperature plummets as she passes through a thermal curtain. She swings her singing stick before her. The canopy is a colander stippling the beetle-swarmed surfaces. Sword fern, liverworts, lichen, things with leaves as small as sand grains stain every inch of the dank logs. The mosses are thumbnail forests all their own. More bushwhacking reveals the prodigious rot. Creature-riddled bowls crumbling for centuries. Snags gothic and twisted, silver as inverted icicles. She presses on a fissure of bark and her fingers sink in. Fecund putrefaction fills her lungs. The sheer mass of ever-dying life packed into each cubic foot, woven together by fungal filaments and dew-betrayed spiderweb, leaves her woozy. Mushrooms ladder up the sides of trunks, soaked by fog all winter long, spongy green bays she can't name, coats every wooden pillar to a height well above her head. The forest pulls her along, past the trunk of an immense western red cedar. Her hand pats the fibrous strips of a trunk whose fluted girth rivals the height of an eastern dogwood. It reeks of incense. The top has sheared off, replaced by a candelabra of boughs promoted to stand in trunks. A grotto opens a ground level in the rotted heartwood, large enough to house whole families of mammals. She addresses the cedar in the phrases of this forest's first humans. Long life maker, I'm here, down here. She feels foolish, but each word is a little easier than the next. Thank you for the baskets and boxes Thank you for the capes and hats and skirts. Thank you for the cradles, the beds, the diapers, canoes, 
paddles, harpoons and nets, poles, logs, posts, the rot-proof shakes and shingles, the kindling that will always light. Finding no good reason to quit now, she lets the goods spill out. Thank you for the tools, the chests, the decking, the doors and floors, the beams and paneling, I forget. Thank you, she says, following the ancient formula for all these gifts that you have given. And still not knowing how to stop, she adds, we're sorry. We didn't know how long it takes you to grow back. That's a beautiful passage. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me when I read your stuff is, I, I apologize, your work. <laughs> it's all stuff. My stuff is good. <laughs> it, stuff, I think, is actually, uh, it comes through Germanic. It, it means material, right? Fabric. Right? Well, that's what I had in mind. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when I read your stuff, uh, what, one of the things that strikes me in this passage and in, and in everything is very often we think about Nonfiction, and you, ra you, ra you raised this this point earlier. Like, if you're trying to persuade someone of something, you, often you think you'll write nonfiction or write an argument. And in nonfiction, you have a particular kind of responsibility to have a relationship to the real world that people can count on. They can say, "Okay, he said that," so I could go out in the real world and find something that's like that. Mm -hmm. And in fiction, maybe you shouldn't be burdened by that in the same way. But it seems like when when you write fiction. You take that responsibility of a nonfiction writer just as seriously as if you were writing essays. You you got this this essay you wrote about what what does fiction know, right? And that that deals with the complexities of this. And I wondered if you could talk about what what it means to be writing fiction versus nonfiction, where you see yourself in there. Yeah, and and that relationship has changed a lot for me over the course of the books. But the books are unusual in that regard. I mean, I um, can't remember which literary critic said this about Shakespeare, uh, something about um, it's amazing how much poetry his audience would sit still for on their way to blood and thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I feel like these books, it's like amazing how much science the reader has to sit still for on their way to character revelation you know, or you know, human passion. But to me, science is a human passion, right? And, and the change that it's effected on us, you know, the, 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 our deepening understanding of the world beyond us is not separable from our search for personal meaning, right? Um, so the key has always been to try to show the passionate side of, of our cognitive search. And reciprocally, you know, the, the amount of information that's needed in order to make story work. So in this book, I would like to say, um, that everything that's put forward as a scientific discovery w was consensually backed at the point of time of my writing of the book. We know science doesn't stand still at all. But, um, and, and, and in a weird way, it's, it's being rigorous with, that, with those factual matters the verifiable, empirical, repeatable, consensually agreed upon body of knowledge that science represents that I think earns me the right to be a little woo woo on the, on the, on the personal side, <laughs> right? You know, because that's all us. It's all us. And I, I, I asked Andrew at dinner, I said, you know, be honest with me. Was, was there any moment <laughs> when, you, when you just kind of sucked your breath in and say, oops, he got that wrong, you know, and, and uh, I, I'll tell him about that for the second edition. And you said. Well, there was one point where he says there's 600 oaks and there's, there's 425. 
<laughs> as far as we know, as far as we know. However, <laughs> what, what would the count have been in 1975? Oh, in 1975? 600. Right. <laughs> yeah, I right? didn't even think about that. I apologize. Right? Because yeah. that, that, that revision downwards right. is a relatively recent text, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's about, yeah 2006. Yeah. So. I, <laughs> <laughs> I gave him that. <laughs> yeah. Just thinking about species, I, I feel badly that I said that over dinner. <laughs> um, so... Thinking about species, every character in this book is tied to a species, right? right? And it's, it's done very nicely and very explicitly and doesn't feel unnatural. And it, it could have, but it, it comes off very nicely. How, was it explicit? Did you find, did you think, I ha here's a species I want to incorporate, here's what that character looks like, or was it more organic than that? What did that look like? That bridge was built from both directions depending on the characters. Now, see, one of the challenges of the book is that there are a lot of main characters. There are nine major characters, and that's, that's a lot for, for a book. And it's a, it's a lot to keep straight. And you know, interestingly, we were talking about this tension between trying to write a book that's scientifically accountable, but, but also expansive and lyrical and, and, and a little mystical. That's a difficult balancing act, but the other difficult balancing act you know, is is writing a book that's both social realism, but also allegorical and mythical, right? The book the book incorporates so many myths and legends from you know world literature, and you know to find to find the tree at the heart of almost every earthly culture was such an a, an amazing adventure for me. So to make my characters emblems of a tree is an old style of working. You know, it's a, it's a way of going back to that kind of uh, indigenous storytelling where there wasn't a huge difference between us and them. And that's why Ovid becomes such a recurring figure throughout the book, you know. Uh, you know, the first lines of Metamorphosis, let me tell you about how people turn into other things. You know, and, and to me, if you, you know, to, to try to tell the story about the Timber Wars inside the framework of contemporary America, while still saying, "Look, let we have to. We don't only have to go back home to the to the non-human world. We have to go back to our own roots, when we would never dare tell a story about ourselves without these other creatures front and center. You know, we couldn't understand ourselves without them. So." To have each of these characters be an emblem or be emblematized by by a particular species, it's it's a stretch when you're thinking about defending everything in terms of pure realism. You know, the kind of books that we know how to read, everything has to be kind of justified in a realist mimetic frame. I, my goal was to get enough of that in so that most readers are comfortable just moving forward, but then to keep slipping the mythical in, keep slipping the allegorical in, and, and, and expanding or reviving old ways of storytelling. One way that we kind of solved this in, in the book is not to make that ever explicit, but in, this, in each of the stories that introduces these characters, just to have a botanical engraving at the head of the chapter. And, and those who are interested and those who are looking will see, ah, that, that guy's the chestnut. You know? oh, there's the oak and linden, right? With this, which is Baucus and Philemon. So yeah, um, it's not a pure allegory, but it's not pure realism. It's just another tightrope walk. Yeah. You, that's not the only way you bring Ovid in, though. Ovid comes in over and over and over again. And I think about the, the... Do you mind if I read a quote to you from your book? I bet you'll recognize it. <laughs> so this is when uh, uh, the programmer is speaking. It says, the wild-haired sadhu leans forward so fast he almost pitches out of his wheelchair. He says, yes, and what do all good stories do? They're no takers. Nile holds up his arms and extends his palms in the oddest gesture. In another moment, leaves will grow from his fingers. Birds will come and nest in them. They kill you a little, he says. They turn you into something you weren't. And throughout the book, every character, this is one of the things that's so moving about the book, is every character does become better. 
but by breaking something that's very, very fundamental to them that they thought they couldn't do without. And I don't know what to say about that, except <laughs> could you talk about that? So the way I want to run with that, I haven't tried in public before, so I'm, I'm just kind of winging this. But, you know, we're at this moment, and I think we're all in shock, you know, and we're all grieving and we're all a little terrified because we know we're not holding it together, right? And we know that the way we live is intrinsically unstable and unsustainable. But where do we go? You know, like Frederick Jameson said, he's, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And it's really true, you know? Here we are, how do we get, how do we reconnect? How do we go forward with this? And it seems to me the way forward is, as you say, that the, that the conversion moment happens when you hit the bottom, when you break. And we're heading there. And, and the, 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 the place we have to reconstitute ourselves in looks so different from where we are now. We, you know, we've assimilated without even knowing it this belief that meaning is personal and private and invented by us each separately, right? And that somehow, you know, we can go it alone, both, you know, as, as individual people, but also an individual species, you know, that we can just kind of declare ourselves autonomous and independent. And it's so deeply ingrained that it's hard even to see the degree to which we've assimilated that. And it's also hard for us to imagine, wait, how can we get back to a place where meaning is out there? And, and we didn't invent it. And, and to me, that's when we break, it will be the, the, the launching of the realization that there is that life wants something, the planet wants something, the planet is a living thing, it's not a geophysical set of processes and rules, right? And while science can't talk about the desires of life and, the, and the, uh, what it would mean to align ourselves with the wishes of the earth, fiction can, right? And, and that's where we need to reconstitute ourselves. We need to go to this place where suddenly the things that I'm doing and what I'm working for, rehabilitating the earth, is as important to me as the stockpiling of commodities once were, you know, uh, that one, once was, and, and in that, that it's a kind of meaning that doesn't die when I die. I mean, there is simply nothing in the kind of meaning that we're devoting our lives to now that can stave off mor with mortality, which is why Silicon Valley was so keen on trying to solve the death problem, right? Um, it, we're, we're completely under this spell of believing that somehow, like, you know, when, when, they, when they asked John Rockefeller how much is enough, and his answer is just a little bit more, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of lives we're leading now, right? And if we, if we break and we come out on this other place, and the other place is no matter what I do, if I'm working for the rehabilitation of this living place, then the work goes on when I die, and I don't have to fear it anymore. And whatever world we inherit, however deranged, however broken it is, right? You know, nature remains, as Whitman says, right? I mean, people say, "Do you have hope?" And I say, "Not for us, right? Not not in our current configuration, right? We've been around for 150,000 years." And it's not looking good. But trees, you see, they've been around for 350 or 400 million if you go all the way back, right? And it's such a good idea <laughs> that it was in, invent, invented multiple times, right? Like at least six different times, right? And, 
And they've lived through many mass extinctions. And they're going to live through the one that we're throwing at them. So if we said their fate and our fate are combined, and I can work for their rehabilitation, right? That's, I, I just think that's the only way of moving into this, this world, whatever the features are, however dis, you know, dismantled and dis destroyed and deranged the world that we're moving into is, that's meaning, and that's hope, and that's persistence. As much as I'd like to sit up here for like four hours and have this conversation. Me I, too. Yeah, I, this has been really exciting and very enjoyable. And I know that people in the audience have questions as well. So this will be the time when, um, if you haven't already typed questions into your device, you may do so at this point. And for those of you who don't have, they have microphones. This, this app, by the way, would make Neelay very happy. This kind of... Okay, um, so the first question is, thank you for writing such a beautiful, powerful, overwhelming book. My question is, what do you suggest we do at a local level in our yard and community to best support a robust future for more trees? That's really a great question. And, and it's asking, already it's, it's like halfway to the right answer. But, you know, I'm reading an interesting book now by Charles Eisenstein called uh, Climate, a New Story. Has anyone else had a look at this? You know, it's just, we're, we're really keyed into this idea that we're gonna live or die based on controlling emissions, right? And it's such a mechanical thing, like if we, if, we, if we go beyond a certain parts per million, we're dead, and if we don't, we're gonna be okay. And he says, look, it's, it's distracting people from the realization that we could, you know, we could go over tomorrow from burning hydrocarbons to, to solar energy and renewables. If we were still trashing the place, it doesn't make any difference, right? This so is what we need to do is heal the world. And the world can best be healed locally because it requires living in a place to know what works and doesn't work. And I mean at every level of locality, right? Um, it's only someone who becomes indigenous to the place again that can say, ah, you know, this is, what nat this is what water is trying to do here. And this is what the grasses are trying to do here. And this is what the trees are trying. I mean, this is the work that you, you do here in the Arboretum, right? Let's figure out the local affordances of all of these forms of life and watch it for a long, long time and then push in the right direction, right? And, and I think that's the answer. Um, a state of attentiveness to, um, to what the local species are doing with each other and for each other, a, a look at where it's breaking down because of human um, deformation, and it attempts both on the social side and on the, the, net, on the, the living, the biological side, to, to remedy those impairments and those derangements. And, and, and Eisenstein says, look, you know, if, if you heal enough local spots of the world, you know, the, the, the world is going to begin to mend its own deformation faster, right? Every, every contribution produces its own cascade, right? Can you take a question from the audience as well? Oh, by the way, he, you know, he puts water first, you know, uh, before atmosphere. And that's something that people, you know, when you think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to rehabilitate my corner of this place, I can't do anything about the atmosphere, but you can do something about, the, about water where you are, right? So that's, that's an interesting meditation. I don't really have a question. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little story. Uh, I live in Roselle, go to Roselle Library, and they carry books every once in a while. And one of the books that was available was an enhanced copy of The Overstory. They have it with me. And, and uh, I just was intrigued by the title, The Trees.
you were top 10. Then it came down to the last five. And then it was like you did a win. And to be honest, I said, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> and then about a month or so later, I saw that you won the Pulitzer Prize. And I went, yes, I knew I was right. <laughs> I was telling everybody about this book. I said, I love this book. I had never heard about it. I just picked it up at the library. And I have it. Well, bless you. That's, that's lovely. <laughs> I, I have to say, you know, it, it is marvelous to have been shortlisted for these prizes and to have, have, have won prizes. But boy, there's nothing like somebody writing you a letter saying, I'm walking down my street and seeing this tree that I've passed for 25 years, and you'll never believe what it's doing. <laughs> right? That's a prize in itself. Yeah. Oh, lovely. I don't even have any of those. <laughs> Yeah, probably um, here and there. But, you know, the, the passage that I read tonight, I marked it up. I mean, that's the thing about writing. It never stops, you know. And, and uh, unfortunately, the, it does get arrested in, you know, certain editions. But it's a, it's a process, you know. And like a living thing, it just, it, it's self-modifying. Okay, so we have another question. When I was reading your book, I was reminded of Italio Calvino's Baron in the Trees. Oh, how lovely. And yeah. Peter, is it Wollebens? The Hidden Life of Trees. Peter Wollebens, yeah. 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 What was some of your fictional and non-fictional inspirations while writing? Oh, that's terrific. Um, the Calvino was incredible. Speaking of stories that uh, operate in an allegorical vein, this is a beautiful um, folktale. And I did read this as a young man. Um, you know about uh, about uh, this this person who decides to go go up in the tree and stay there, right, and make a life up there. Um, and I, I thought about it a lot when I was writing about the tree sitters in in, in you know the in the timber wars. Uh, and maybe some of you have read some of the accounts. Julia Butterfly Hill is a very you know uh, one of the most famous of the of the tree sitters, and she ended up thinking that she was going up for, I don't know, I can't remember, it was a short period of time, like she'd be up there for a week, and she ended up there a lot more than a year. I can't even remember what the final count for her was. But, but the Calvino came back to me when I was trying to describe what life at 200 and some feet is like, you know, for these two people who are up there, and, and, and just reinventing themselves, you know, day after day, week after week, at the top of, of, of this enormous tree. Um, the, the Peter Wolleben, you know, I, I was about four years into my project, and I knew I had maybe a year left of composition when I read that there was this book that had just been published in Germany that was all about trees and tree communication and tree society and tree... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And... and I, I, I asked my German publishers to send me a copy, and my German just, you know, wasn't up to reading it, you know. So I just pressed on, and then when the English came out, I was quite relieved because it's a lovely book, um, and it's a great grand synthesis of a lot of the research that we were talking about, the recent, you know, the new forestry research. And he, it, I, what I was happy about was just about every source that he goes to and cites and explicates, I'd already read in the primary sources. So it was, I, did, I felt like, okay, I pretty much, you know, I pretty much got, hit all the landmarks that I need to hit. But it's a love, it's a, it's a wonderful single volume, uh, nonfiction uh, synopsis of, of how, you know, the, the, the recent transformation in our understanding of how complicated uh, tree behavior really is. So other Books, gosh, uh, I'd say Barbara Kingsolver is a great, great writer of of um, the relationship between humans and non-humans. She can tell a story that has you turning pages, and you just want to know what happens to those people. But what happens to those people has everything to do with their ability to see and be changed by things beyond people, you know, living things beyond people. So I took a lot of uh, um, inspiration from her, which was marvelous. When she ended up writing the New York Times book review of our story, I thought, "Wow, the book landed in the hands of the perfect, you know, the person that I who, who's at whose feet I studied." So that was really nice. Um, one thing I realized in the introduction, I didn't, we didn't introduce 
a tree that's also sharing this space. Ah. And, and I didn't know if either of you wanted to talk about that tree. I don't know a lot about Castanea pumila. <laughs> Uh, this this species is Castanea pumila, which is the uh, the Allegheny chestnut. It's not an American. Of course, American chestnuts were taken out by the chestnut blight. And it's it's more diminutive. It is susceptible to chestnut blight, but not as susceptible as I understand it. If you if you go to Google. And you, and you do a Google image search for American chestnut smokies, you'll see why they called that tree the redwood of the east. There, there are families, I mean, famous pictures of families of like nine people lined up in front of the bowl of these trees, you know, deciduous eastern tree. And when I tell the story you know, of how, how the blight gets introduced in New York in the, in the earliest years of the 20th century. And by 1940, all the mature chestnuts are dead. And you just feel like uh, the, your, your heart gets torn out of your chest when you realize one in every four eastern trees down where I lived was an American chestnut. The cool thing about living in the Smokies now, and I was telling these guys, you know, this afternoon, the chestnut keeps coming back like like the, the it basil sprouts so you know a, a, a big dead tree that's been dead since 1940 you, you walk through the park and you'll see the little chestnuts coming up and they live six or seven years and then the bark starts to fissure and they get the blight and they die and it's almost like just enough of them continue to live in order to keep the blight viable in that area you know it's a horrible kind of but every so often you see a bigger tree and you know, like I've, I've seen American chestnuts that are, you know, a, a, a foot and a half in diameter and have been producing nuts for a long, long time. They're not all gone. There are a lot of trees outside the native range, cultivated trees that have survived, but there are some trees in the native range that for whatever reason have, have resistance or enough resistance to, to reach a certain size. Now, you may know that there are a couple of efforts to uh, reintroduce the chestnut or some back crossed, you know, um, as, as close to the, to the pure American chestnut genome as they can get, uh, but with resistance. And there are two different programs that have taken very different approaches, and they're now getting to the point where they're starting to, to, to release trees into the wild. So it may be that this, what, they, what people have called America's perfect tree, you know, will be back in some form. Um, and I've been told that, uh, the Endangered Trees project here at the Arboretum, which is going to start breaking ground a year from now, um, will be thinking about uh, chestnut as, as part of the, the, the collection that will be planted. I think we have a question from the audience. Okay. Actually, you sort of anticipated my question a little bit. Um, I was going to ask, what drew you from California to move out to the Smokies, and um, what have you found living there for sort of a period of time? I love the question, and it's a dangerous one to ask at 8.07 because we could be here at midnight, and <laughs> I'll, I'll still be answering it. But so um, I did come back from California after my, my conversion experience and came back to these eastern forests that I'd grown up in, you know, being a Chicago boy. Um, and saw them for the first time, right? And and now with with a new kind of level of literacy or you know um, attention, saw the richness and the complexity and the the beauty of these forests. But the number the number that I gave for the redwood decimation, you know, roughly ninety five or you know, to ninety eight percent gone, is also true for forests in north in in the United States as a whole which means it's extremely difficult to find an eastern old growth forest. Extremely difficult. Um, in fact, there's a little bit more old growth western forest. And, you know, I mean like 5%, whereas it's like 2% for, for, for the east. Um, and these, you know, you have to understand American history as f these four enormous great forests, each one of which were declared inexhaustible which we cut through in a couple of centuries. No. Um, 
and as I was reading, I thought, I want to see this old growth forest because, as you know, we hinted at earlier, there is a difference. There, you know, the the, the richness and the complexity, um, the number of species that are associated with with an old growth tree, the number of invertebrate species that are, you know, that are that use that tree as a host. I mean, these numbers are are so so different for primary forests than for regrowth forests. And I just thought, I, I, you know, I have to see them. And, and I kept reading that if you want to see eastern broadleaf original primary forest, Smokies is the place to go. Because about a quarter of the park has ne was never cut. And it's the largest. I, I think there's more old growth inside that park than in the rest of the eastern US. So I went there four years ago. and. Our, you, you, you know, you start in regrowth, and the regrowth is beautiful, and it's diverse, and it's lovely. And, you know, two miles up, two and a half miles up the trail, something happens, and you cross the threshold. And you, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to know anything about trees to know you've just gone into another world. It, the light is different, the sound is different, the smell is different. The richness is different. And you know what happens in an old growth forest? You know, when you see regrowth, like we were walking through today, there's a lot of same width trunks. And it's kind of dark. And they, they grow pretty close together. And it looks old. It looks dark and forbidding. And when you get into the actual old growth, it's gappy. And there are big chunks of light and chunks of darkness and trees that are this skinny and trees that are, you know, 25 feet in circumference, you know, sycamores and, and uh, um, tulip poplars, enormous trees. And I suddenly stopped and I thought, this, this is my patrimony. This is my country's forest. I've never seen it. I've never seen a healthy functioning forest before. This, this is the way it looked before the Europeans came. And not, not only that, because, because the management of the Cherokee is so, was so light, you could say, this is what the forest looked like 8,000 years ago, you know, at the last ice age. I, and I just I couldn't stop thinking about it. You know, it was just a research trip. I was just trying to write a novel. And, and, and months later, I was still thinking about it. And I thought, that's got to tell you something. So I went back, and I, and I bought a house there. And I've been living there ever since. And, you know, and I, I now have this amazing, amazing backyard. And uh, I, there, there are 120 species of trees in the Smokies. That's more than in all of Europe, from Portugal to the Baltic States. You know, and of course, it doesn't match the the tropics where you can get 600 species in a couple of hectares. But it's pretty good for North America. And I learn something every day. And I and I and I feel like a different person when I'm you know, when I'm there. Yeah, and it it has. I finished the novel down there, and I started my new novel down there, and it's really changed my relationship to how I I write and and how I live and what I do every day. But you know, having said that, I think it's important also to say you don't have to go to the sm Smokies to be attentive to astonishment. I mean, w w you know, the peregrine falcon, right? Incredible bird that was on the verge of extinction. The densest population of peregrine falcons in, in North America is New York City, right? So be, be where you are, you know? And, 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 and see where you are, you know, because there's a lot going on. Um, so fiction is built around conflict and resolution. How does, the play, how does that play out in the overstory? If the trees are the heroes, who is the villain? Yeah. And, you know, the book has been taken to task by people who said, well, you know, uh, you should have dramatized a logger and, and shown the economic compulsion. You know, you should, you should have made the other side sympathetic. Um, but it really, you know, to me, it's not really about the morality, the, the, the advisability, the inadvisability of cutting the last 2% of old growth forest. Um, it's about what, what would it take for a person who has no particular investment to suddenly realize that 
they haven't been seeing the world, right? So the villain of the book is this state of mind that I was talking about earlier, this separatist, human exceptionalist, individualist obsessed, commodity mediated mentality that says, you know, I'm, I'm in it alone. You know, that kind of fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged thing, you know. Um, uh, to me, the, the drama in the book is how to escape that mentality. What it would take and what it looks like once you do. Um, as far as drama, you know, just a very quick thing, you know. Uh, um, I have to say, my beloved high school English teacher is here tonight. So... <laughs> I, I learned everything I know about the drama of fiction. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I humiliate you any more than I already have? <laughs> but, you know, we used, to, we, we used to talk about sources of drama and, you know, that old formula. Um, man against man, you know, it was a very sexist formula back in the day. You know, we'd have to revise the language now. But man against man, man against himself and man against the outside, man against the elements. And man against himself or a person at war with their own values is psychological drama. We're incredible at telling that story now. You know, the, 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 the novelists, you know, these, the best of American novelists who are alive right now, it's like, oh my God, you know, by the end, you're turned inside out, you're weeping for how, you know, how short-sighted we all are and how, you know, how hurt we all are. So psychological drama, man against himself, per person against herself, his or herself, man against man, social drama or political drama, what happens when your values are perfectly defensible and my values are perfectly defensible, but they're at war with each other? We're really good at that, right? And the, and the, the political and social novel in the sense of, oh my God, you know, what a drama it is just trying to live with each other. And we've kind of forgotten that third kind of drama which is life outside of us wants things that we don't necessarily want. And to live here, we have to accommodate a complicated place that requires us to change our values, right? This, we stopped telling that story a long time ago in the West, right? Not that long ago, actually, probably probably the late 19th century, because we thought we won that war. We thought the battle between people and, and nature was over, and we won it, and we dominated, and there's no more drama. We can have it our way. Well, we know now that we can't have it our way. In fact, it's coming back to bite us with a vengeance. And you'll see literary fiction now start to rediscover that there's an entirely different set of dramas that we need to start thinking about again. Um, the characters in the book are all moved to action for trees. What do you think we can each do in real life to take meaningful action? So I'm going to go back to that idea of studying where you are and, and healing the part of the world that you live in and know about. But the, the first step is attention. Right? The first step is simply standing still and being present, not to what you think should be out there, but to what is out there. Right? And yes, my book is about activists who put their bodies and lives on the line because once the old growth is gone, it's never coming back. And you can do that. And, there, and you know, when you... When you listen to Greta Thunberg at the UN this week, right? I mean, you, you talk about evisceration, right? That, that is world transforming work, but it's also world transforming work to say, I am seeing the world around me in a different way, and I'm understanding what it's asking of me in a different way. You know, the, I, I keep coming back to this beautiful quote from um, Thoreau's Notebooks. Um, 
breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruits, live in each season as it passes, resign yourself to the influence of the earth. It is a form of activism to resign yourself to the influence of the earth, to discover it and to give yourself to it and to, and to aid it where you can. Sorry, I've been... Can you hear me all right? Oh, I guess you can. And I don't mean to be rude by jumping up. Um, I look forward very much to reading your book. And I... Hello? Okay. But I have read the Liebenwolf book, a Wolf, a Wolf Lieben book, and it's so profound. He talks very similarly talks about entering a forest where he sees a 300-year-old stump that's still alive because the trees around it are nurturing it. It goes on and on. But my question, I mean, it's unbelievable, the insights. He manages a forest outside of Hummel. But I, what is your response to the fact that 2,500 scientists across Europe signed a petition against him against his writing, against these principles that you're talking about. They are so afraid that his, for, his forest management includes, he wants the trees to be brought down only by horses going into the forest. That, I mean, that's a lot of scientists. I guess my question is, I'm stunned. Maybe your book should be translated into German. I don't know. But <laughs> it sounds it, like it has been. nonfiction yeah. isn't doing it. I wasn't aware of that, were you? Yes. Yeah. Two thousand. And, and what are what are the indictments? The indictments was that he's exaggerating. That they also it's really the commercial thing. That if if you follow forest management in the way that you are describing, they're not going to be able to harvest in the way that they feel they need to harvest. The book also brings out facts like I mean the fact that all of Europe, all these lovely forests, the black forests, it's all fake in some way. Those are regrowths. They don't have. They wouldn't have conifers originally, mm. and so he's talking about managing pretty much a birch forest. Anyway, it's a great book, right. but, I, but and I, I'm not trying to take away from yours. But I'm, no. I was so stunned that two thousand. That's a lot of science. Yes, yeah. and I'd I'd love to read the petition, but I think you may have put your finger on at least part of it because because management remains a deeply controversial thing. Right, even with all of these revolutions in what we call the new forestry, it's it's controversial, partly because of the science, and you know the the if there is no separation between humans and non-humans, and we have been shaping the forest since the beginning of Homo sapiens, then it, it then a romanticized idea of nature where you try to leave pristine and untouched wilderness is misguided. There is no such thing as pristine and untouched wilderness. So I don't know if that's what the accusation is, but there's a more complicated uh, uh, problem with management too, which is, and you, you alluded to this as well. Whatever the science says, society is saying something else. And you know, the, the, un, until, you know, un, until we become this different kind of creature, our, our allegiances are going to be, to some extent, to the person and, or to the, to the mechanisms, to the institutions that are cutting the checks. I, I don't know. I'd have to see the petition to... to but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if part of the controversy is simply this notion of... Um, you know the, the the nostalgia of believing in this in in the untouched forest as the ideal forest. Um, you know the yeah yeah. You know I I, I allude to something. You know the uh, Joe Maloof, who's written a number of books on trees, really good books on trees, said the best way to to rehabilitate a forest is to do nothing, right? There's some wisdom in that, but it's also controversial from in, in I don't know, would you have anything to, to, I think there are other people who are saying actually, um, humans are extremely capable of accelerating, uh, observing and intensifying processes 
um, if it if it's wise and if it if it involves lots of knowledge. I would only say it depends on the forest. I mean, a lot of forests around here need management to to stay diverse and to stay functional. And if they're the way things are now, if they're if they're left to their own devices, they'll degenerate. But it has to do with the fact that we've brought a lot of species over that are highly competitive. Started that deformation, we can't expect it to return to you know pristine state. Yeah, so it's going to involve intervention, no matter what. And this is sort of another intervention, but unfortunately, I think our questions are to a close. I wish, I hope the audience can join me in thanking both Richard and Andrew. <laughs> <laughs>